the cerebellum is, I mean, the word cerebellum means the little brain. I've noticed that myself, like when I get tired and I teach class, I'll say cerebrum by mistake. And I've noticed that students will do the same thing if they're not really paying attention on a quiz, a test, a homework, whatever it is. So just, just be careful. It's like it's such an easy mistake to make um, auditorily. And we could talk about that in another PowerPoint. <laughs> but the cerebellum, um, called the little brain, it generally contributes to somatic motor output. And we know that somatic means our skeletal muscles. So in thinking about skeletal muscles, the cerebellum takes a big part in adjusting posture. So um, information that's received from the brain and the spinal cord is kind of like accumulated in the cerebellum and then it's analyzed and an output is put out there. The cerebellum, it also fine tunes movements at, at both the conscious and subconscious level. So for example, you can train yourself to fine tune movements for needlepoint, um, knitting. I mean, my knitting has gotten so much faster over time. That happens by training my neurons. You also fine tune movements at a subconscious level. So if you raise your hand, raise your hand. So if you raise your hand, you stop it at a certain place. You don't overshoot it, you don't undershoot it, and the cerebellum kind of regulates that. So as a great example, pe people with cerebral palsy usually have oxygen deprivation that affects this part of the brain, the cerebellum. And many people with CP have a hard time fine tuning movement. Let's do a little general anatomy of the cerebellum. You can, oh, this picture here is a sagittal cut down the cerebellum. So we've cut it, look, look at the brain. Look at this picture of the brain up here, right? Look at how we've cut that. That's that square right there. And we've cut it right down the center line and we're looking from the side in at the cerebellum. So in this picture, it's really easy to see that the cerebellum, they, they've colored some lobes here of the cerebellum and that the cerebellum has gray matter on the outside. And this would be unmyelinated neurons. And in fact, the neurons of this gray matter are specific. They're called Purkinje cells. These cells, they don't just exist in the cerebellum. We'll see them in the heart and in the digestive system but they're designed in a way to transmit action potentials very quickly to a large area of flesh, basically. The white matter, which is the juicy middle, the white matter in the middle is myelinated neurons. And I like this picture here on the left because this is what you would see if you made this cut in a sheep brain dissection in the physical lab. And you see exactly this. The white matter forms this tree-like structure, and those tree branches are all, they're all covered by that gray matter outside, or gray matter bark, which is what the word cortex means. It means like bark of a tree. So this structure here is called the arbor vitae, and it's very characteristic of the cerebellum. Unfortunately, if you were to make a slide of the cerebellum, and if you were to choose one of the very common stains that we've been seeing all throughout the class, which is a pink stain, the white matter on the inside takes up the stain better. The myelin sucks it up. And so look at this picture. The yellow arrow is pointing to white matter on the inside, but it has a darker color than the gray matter on the outside. And this, I just want to remind you that what you see in a 2D picture, what you see in a 3D lab where you do a dissection, and what you see in a microscope slide can be very different. You have to establish this skill of differ differentiating that. And you have throughout this class. Okay, so how does it work? If you want to um, lift, okay, if you want to wiggle your big toe, Right? How does that happen? How do all these parts like work together to send an action potential down your sciatic nerve and make you contract the muscles in your big toe and wiggle your big toe? I'm gonna to refer to this picture on the right. 
and I'm going to highlight some things, but there is some color coding here. So number one, you have a thought in your cerebrum, which is the big brain hat. And you usually have that thought in an area called the premotor cortex. Sometimes it's in the frontal lobe. It depends. That's very complicated to say. But that thought comes barreling down these fibers here into the pons and the pons is like oh okay you want to move your big toe and it sends information to the cerebellum so that's the first thing is that we've notified of like an intent to move like hey i want to move my big toe the second thing is that the cerebellum says okay fine you want to move your big toe i need to know where and how your leg and your foot and your toe are positioned so the cerebellum calls for some sensory information, which rises up the spinal cord into the cerebellum. So now the cerebellum has the intent and it has like your starting position. And what it does is it calculates your existing posture and how to change it to the posture that you want. And this is what happens in the nuclei in the cerebellum. The nuclei of the neurons that are housed there are there to calculate movements and patterns and to regulate movements and patterns. So the nuclei, once they calculate things, they then relay their information up to the thalamus, which then relays the information to the premotor cortex and says, I would like to make this movement Here's how to make this movement. I don't have this picture here, but the premotor cortex communicates to the primary motor cortex and sends an action potential down your spinal cord. I'll talk about that in a another slide. <laughs> I like this. This little man here is called a homunculus. You hear this word in many different ways used in poetry and literature. Um, but it's basically, it's how your cerebellum sees your body. Um, it sees your hands as really big because there's a lot of sensory information that can come from them. Also, remember what I said, you can do fine-tuned movements like needlepoint. You have to have a, a large area of control to do that. Your feet, same thing, it sees them as really, really big. It doesn't see your thighs or your arms as very large, but it does see your face. Talking about the face, let's talk about Parkinson's disease. There are a couple signs and symptoms. Let's talk about the signs. Number one, Parkinson's comes with an, a condition called, that's usually called stone face. And this has to do with the lack of ability to initiate action potentials to control the muscles of the face. So even though the person wants to smile, nothing is happening because the action potentials are not reaching the skeletal muscles of the face for them to make a voluntary smile. Many people will have a tremor. It usually happens in a hand. Um, a tremor is an indication that you have an overactivity of skeletal muscles. So stone face is about locking you up. Tremor is about releasing you to have these repeated skeletal muscle traction, contractions, making a tremor. Specific to Parkinson's disease, tremors can be controlled. When the hand grips a pencil um, or does needlepoint, the tremor will stop in the beginnings of Parkinson's, but then it moves on to a point where it doesn't stop. People with Parkinson's also have a loss of balance and a very specific gait. They kind of uh, shuffle and they're hunched over. And this is why people with Parkinson's are recommended to wear slippery shoes, like slippers, nothing with a big grip, so that they can slide their feet. This loss of balance reminds us of the previous slide and how the cerebellum inter interacts with the brain to create a movement, right? We indicate an intent, we gain information, and then we send the intent back. In order to do all of these things, we need dopamine to excite action potentials. 
Sorry, I don't know what to say. Like we need dopamine to work at the synapses between all of the neurons. So all of these movements, all of these communications, they're all dopamine regulated. You need dopamine. Now, dopamine is made in a place of the brain called the substantia nigra. This picture is difficult to understand. Let's see where we are. This is an inferior view of the brain. This little square here is the midbrain. So that's the area between the thalamus and the pons. Think about where I'm talking. Let's draw our brain stem with the pons. It's this area right here. Look, 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 olfactory nerves. We've got the optic chiasma. You've even got a big bulb there indicating the pituitary gland. This is a cross section of the midbrain in that area. And I'm telling you that dopamine is made in the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra, it's a, a collection of neuron cell bodies that's in this part of the midbrain and it's this little like, this little wiggle on either side of the substantia, of the this part of the midbrain. So those lines, those wiggly lines are the substantia nigra. There are some other um, features here. Don't miss the cerebral aqueduct. We talked about that being the gateway to the fourth ventricle and then the spinal canal, right? Um, these are two new things, the red nucleus. They're just nuclei, they're red. And we'll talk about what the reticular formation is. So um, to do all of these movements, we need dopamine. It's made in the substantia nigra. And it's used in the basal nuclei. So the basal nuclei need the dopamine to initiate many of these movements. And when dopamine is being made, the substantia nigra develops this very dark color, like the picture at the top of the midbrain. And that's because melanin is made as a byproduct. So as the substantia nigra is making dopamine, melanin accumulates in it. And that's why you see that those wiggly stripes. In somebody with Parkinson's, they're not making dopamine. And their substantia nigra does not have a dark color. With no dopamine, they can't regulate the communication with their basal nuclei, the cerebrum, anything in the cerebellum. And that's what creates all of these signs, stone face, tremor, loss of balance. It's a complete loss of the ability to control skeletal muscle. There are some ways to differentiate between Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis. They sound like they do the same thing. And they kind of do, they prevent the initiation of movement, but they do it in two different ways. MS says, I'm gonna make it so your action potentials fizzle out. Parkinson's says, I'm not gonna let you have your neurons communicate to each other using dopamine. Oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to show you this. This is a CT, it has added color. You know, your brain doesn't look like that. But what it's showing you is this is a transverse section of the brain. And those red things over in the healthy brain are the basal nuclei. Over here in the Parkinson's brain, the basal nuclei are not active. And so they're not helping regulate balance and initiate movements. Um, oh, I'm sorry, another, another uh, symptom of Parkinson's is the inability to initiate, like, like my mom would be like, wait, it takes me a moment to get started or the in inability to stop. And that has to do with cerebellar processing breaking down. And so they can't like regulate their movements very well. 